Corey, I'm so happy that you are so hungry for the things of God that you're willing to jump into the Word of God with me and grow in the knowledge of God. I believe just like you can grow in the knowledge of your career field, whether it's biology or medicine or aeronautics or whatever it might be, or the medical industry, I believe that we all are called by the Spirit of God to grow in the knowledge of God. And of course, this knowledge is progressive in nature. We want to talk about that today. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. And before we jump into today's message, I wanted to say thank you to everybody who sent condolences to me uh, for the passing, the graduation of my father into heaven. Praise God. He lived a great life. He was a great man. And I tell you what, on the day of his funeral, his home going, it was just so beautiful. The weather was perfect outside and all of the family was there. I have uh, two brothers. I got to see uh, some other relatives, uh, such as uncles and aunts and so forth, that I rarely get to see, and it was an absolute glorious time as the peace of God, the presence of the Lord, was there. My friends, nothing more important, nothing better than living for Jesus. Hallelujah. Knowing that your life is right with God. So thank you uh, to everybody that uh, sent uh, emails, uh, text messages, and uh, even cards. I really appreciate your care and love and concern. So thank you for that. Praise God. Um, The next two weeks, I'm going to be in Southern California. And I want to invite anybody who is in the area of Orange County, Los Angeles, perhaps you're north or south of those areas. Uh, Come on into those areas. I'm going to be ministering for the next two Sundays in California. Uh, This coming uh, Sunday, I'll be in Los Angeles ministering Sunday morning. And the following Sunday, I'll be in Orange County. Uh, I believe it's Santa Ana, Irvine area. I'll have to check. But it's all on the itinerary. Please visit my ministry website, stephenbrooks.org click on events and you'll have the itinerary information. So if you're uh, close by, maybe you're in uh, Las Vegas, maybe you're in Phoenix or something like that. You just want to come over and get into the presence of the Lord. These are good churches, great pastors, and uh, we're going to be having a really good time in the spirit. I will be ministering, preaching, praying for the sick. So uh, if you're in the areas, uh, jump on out to these meetings. The information is on my ministry website. Uh, By the way, I'll still be streaming the entire time uh, that I'm gone. I'll be gone from the office. Why don't you go with me? Why don't we get out of the office uh, for a few weeks? How about that? Uh, Get me out from behind the desk, praise God, and I'll take you into these meetings uh, on Sunday live with me. I'm just going to stream it live to you. You'll get a notification of when it goes live, and you can follow with me. Uh, Come with me literally into the meetings through a live streaming view, praise God, so you can hear and watch and see and be involved in that. Praise God. Hallelujah. One more note before we jump into today's message. The uh, funds for the cameras and the gear has been raised. That offering is now closed. Thank you so much to each and every one of you that sowed into this uh, into the funds for the cameras. We hit the budget. Praise God. We we hit it right on the mark uh, of what the amount was that God put in my spirit. And you know, it's it takes quite a bit to get this modern technology, but uh, y- you guys and gals have been such a blessing be- that we're actually going to be able to, f- how can I say, as they say in the tech industry, we're going to be able to future-proof the ministry because the cameras that we're going to be purchasing are um, their 4K resolution cameras. So they have the ability to shoot in 4K. Now, I know there's very little 4K content out there right now. So unless you're watching 
uh, Netflix, which has put out a uh, demand to all of their producers and to all movie makers that if you're going to submit a movie to Netflix, everything now has to be in 4K. But outside of that, you and I both know there's not a lot of 4K content out there. Nevertheless, in the years to come, there will be. So these cameras are cutting edge. They're Sony cameras. Uh, we'll be placing the order for this material tomorrow. Uh, 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 that will actually be on Wednesday. It's late Tuesday night. It's almost midnight right now. I'm down at the office all by myself talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. I'll be doing some things in the morning, so I wasn't able to shoot this on Wednesday morning. But nevertheless, on Wednesday, the day that you're watching this, is the day that we will be purchasing uh, the equipment. So since I'm going to be traveling on the road, when I get back, I will show you everything that your dollar was put towards. I'm going to show you what your money was used for because it's used for the kingdom of God and the expansion of preaching the gospel around the world. I really believe that the seed that you sowed into the cameras, into this television equipment, you're going to see God increase you in an aspect of your life 1,000 times. And I really believe it's one of the wisest things that you have done because you are now directly involved you are tied to the harvest every life touched out of the television broadcast you will receive a reward from the Lord for that there will come a day when he will honor you for what you have done praise God and I'm also praying for you that God touch you with a thousandfold increase based upon Deuteronomy 111 praise God and he's going to do that. So in the future, we'll have other projects that we can tackle together. But for now, the camera project is a wrap. Hallelujah. The money's there. We're going to be purchasing the goods. So that is closed out. Hallelujah. And we praise God. We praise God for his faithfulness. And I thank God for you because God works through precious people just like you. And we did it. We did it together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, today, Ephesians chapter 4, let's talk about progressive unfolding of revelation. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we jump into your word, that your word would jump into us and wash us and clean us and give us understanding of who you are. We want to grow in the knowledge of you. Father, we thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. You know, as you sit there today as a, as a believer in the family of God, washed with the blood of Jesus. You are in a very, very privileged position. Wow. It really is, it really is amazing the, the light and the revelation that we are privileged to walk into. You know more than the Old Testament saints ever knew about God and the plan of God because we can look back at the cross, but all they could do is look forward to something that in many ways they were trying to decipher what it was, what it was going to be, and how it was all going to unfold. Well, we already know exactly how it unfolded, but they didn't have that luxury, that privilege. And you see these amazing things in the Bible that gave prophetic foresight of what was to come. You see Moses, the great leader of the nation of Israel, and Moses said that God would raise up a prophet. After Moses passed off the scene, he said, God's going to raise up somebody that's like me. He will be the prophet, and you must listen to him. And so, you know, that went down in, uh, in recorded scripture, and so all students of the scripture, all scribes, all rabbis, they were just like, well, there's going to be a prophet coming. Okay, we've got to be looking for this guy because he's going to be raised up by God, and we must give him attention. Moses has even told us we're going to have to be very careful to listen to everything that the Messiah would say. So they're looking. They're looking. They're anticipating. They're wanting more revelation. They're wanting more knowledge of what this man and what this event is going to be like. And so all the prophets, they, they spoke about it. You had prophets even saying where the Messiah was going to be born at, that he would be born in Bethlehem. And even Herod, in his nervousness 
uh, of finding out that the wise men have come, the magi have come. He he's 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 just confused. He's overwhelmed. He doesn't know what to do. They've come because this prophesied Messiah has been born. And so he called together all of the religious leaders of Judaism and said, okay, where's this guy supposed to be born at? I, I want to know. They, and well, they studied the scriptures. They said, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Okay. So all of these things that we just think, oh yeah, the, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and, you know, um, spent some time down in Egypt to escape uh, the persecution. And even as it says in the Old Testament scriptures, out of Egypt, I have called my son. And, and you know, and they would study these verses out of Egypt. Oh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, but he's going to come out of Egypt and he's going to be a, uh, he's going to be a Nazarene. So he's going to live in Nazareth. So how is all of this going to unfold? What will be the chronological order of all of this? Well, for you and I, we look back on it and we think, well, that's easy. Yeah. He was going to be born in Bethlehem and then they'd spend some time in Egypt and then they would move up into the area of Galilee and so forth. And a lot of these things that we take for granted, they never knew they never knew all of the things that you and I know. That's why Jesus referring to John the Baptist, John the baptizer said that under the old covenant system, he was the greatest. Now he went on to say, the Lord went on to say that, you know, that any of us in essence is greater. I want to see if I can explain that just for a moment. First of all, I used to be puzzled by that statement that John the Baptist was the greatest, greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than Isaiah, greater than all, all of these great men and women of God from the Old Testament, because some of these other guys did incredible miracles, but John didn't do any miracles. He had a phenomenal preacher, it just incredible anointing uh, of the Spirit of God to preach repentance. But you don't you don't see any fire coming down from heaven. You don't see any Red Sea splitting with John. But yet Jesus said he was greater. Why was he greater? Because of progressive revelation. Out of all the Old Testament saints who spoke about the Messiah to come, who gave insight recorded in Scripture of what he would be like, I mean, startling stuff. I mean, you, you look at Isaiah 53, it's jaw-dropping. I mean, the details about Messiah, Jesus, revealed in Isaiah chapter 53, I mean, it gives, it gives information of what even took place on the cross. It even talks about his scourging. You go to Psalm 22, and you're just like, this is incredible. I mean, Psalm 22 talks about what was going on while he was hanging on the cross written a thousand years before he was even born into the world. How they would gamble over his clothes. And oh my goodness, I mean, powerful, powerful stuff. So they knew all of these things, but they still couldn't quite see it. Oh, but John, the baptizer, was greater than all of those under the Old Testament system because out of all the great men, that prophesied out of all the great writers such as Isaiah and the classic Isaiah chapter 53 out of all these amazing things John John was the only prophet who said that's him right there remember the story he's got two of his own disciples and they're walking along by the river and of all things, one of those disciples is Andrew. Did you ever stop to think that out of the 12 apostles, there's only one that we know of that was actually formerly a disciple of John? And so John's walking along, and he says to his two disciples, one of them being the future apostle Andrew, he says to his two disciples, do you see that man right over there? They said, yes. John said, behold, behold. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. <laughs> and Andrew goes, really? That's the one? John says, yes. That's the one that all of the Old Testament uh, scriptures that foretold of, that's actually him walking over there in the flesh. Wow. Well, it was Andrew who went and told his brother Peter, hey, we have found the, the Messiah. Peter's like, really? <laughs> you have? 
You know, so much has been told. We've been looking and waiting for a couple of thousands of years. Are you sure you found him? Yep, we found him. John said, that's him. Well, they all knew John was a serious heavyweight prophet. But even still, there were some great prophets. But John was the only one that said, he was the only one who had the privilege of saying, that's him right there. That's God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. That's God in the flesh walking right there. If you want to meet God in the flesh, that's him walking right over there by the riverbank. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, powerful, powerful stuff. So, progressive, progressive. You read Isaiah, Revelation. Oh, read Ezekiel. Oh, more Revelation. You, you work your way through the Old Covenant. You get some amazing revelation. But eventually, he comes. And now he's on the scene and he fulfills his calling by going to the cross, laying his life down, and being a sacrifice, a sacrifice for the sins of all humanity, of all who have ever lived, all who were living at that time, all who were to come, such as you and I in the future, and even those who are still to come, who are not even born yet, to make provision for the sin of man, that whoever would put their faith and trust in him can receive forgiveness of sins and receive his life, which is eternal life, and have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. So, my friends, you work your way through the Old Covenant, and you come into what is known as the New Testament or the New Covenant, which has been sealed through the blood of Jesus, and you read the Gospels. Matthew, it's, it's amazing. You read the next one, Mark. Wow. Yeah, you think you can't get any better. You read Luke. And you're just like, Lord, I don't think I can take any more. And then you read John, and you feel like you're about to fall out of your chair. Wow. I mean, you read the Gospel of John, it's just hard. It's hard to almost even talk after that. Hallelujah. If there's anybody who's unsaved, and they just, they're just not sure about Jesus, they're not sure about this this Jehovah God. Give them the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or just give them, gift them a Bible. Buy a Bible for them and say, look, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's it. Just read those four <laughs> and tell me if you've ever in your life heard of anything as wild as this. Wow. I mean, I, Muhammad, Muhammad didn't die for anybody. Buddha didn't die for anybody. Uh, you read about all of these different religions of the world, but you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus laid his life down. I mean, he gave his life. So it, all of this is just so, I mean, it, it's, it's mind-boggling, really. Wow. So progressive revelation. Okay, now he's here. Now we see him. Now we read about him, but there's more. There's more. And so if all you had were the Gospels, you'd be like, okay, I think I can get a grasp of what's going on here, but I, I would like to have a little bit more of meat on the bones. That's why there's more. Acts, First and Second Corinthians. And you get into what would be primarily the epistles. Glory to God. Also, you have the book of Romans, which is Paul's most important book, which is why it's out of the books, the letters he wrote, that's put first. It is the the theology of the cross. It is the reason and the explanation of what Christ accomplished for us and what it means to us. And so you continue on. When you continue on into the epistles, the letters that Paul wrote to the various churches, your knowledge of God will increase by leaps and bounds. And when you get, and I want to give today an example as the book of Ephesians. When you get into these epistles, you get into the meat and potatoes of how you and I are supposed to live. Why? Because these writings in the Bible, these particular writings, I'm going to give you an example today of Ephesians, these are written to you and I. These are written to the New Testament believer. Now, Paul told us very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that everything that took place before was written for our example. So, 
we have the records of how the Jews lived and how in so many ways, bless their hearts, they got it wrong. That was written as an example for us so we don't get tangled up in the same kind of stuff. When I say stuff, I'm talking about sin that so many of them got tangled up in and many of them never fulfilled the plan, the calling, the purpose that God had for their life. It was a very grievous time for the Holy Spirit to deal with such continual failure on behalf of the people of God. Very quickly, let's look at it just for a moment. Hold your finger in Ephesians chapter 4, and very quickly flip with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I just want to show you a brief synopsis of the Old Testament encapsulated by just looking at a few things that the Apostle Paul said. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 5, but with most of them, that would have been the Israelites, but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Praise God. Don't ever stuff yourself full of food. I'm going to try to get back to Ephesians 4. <laughs> but, the, but the examples were incredible that were left to us. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They're not, they're not rising up to play chess or checkers. They're rising up to play uh, in the sense of carnal nature of taking their clothes off. My, my friends, don't ever stuff yourself with food. Uh, food is enjoyable. Uh, God gave uh, us food to enjoy. He put taste buds on your tongue. So it, this is more than just getting nutrition to keep the body active. There's pleasure in eating, but don't abuse the gifts that God has given. Don't, don't gorge uh, yourself where, even if you go to a buffet, don't go to a buffet and think, well, I paid $14 and I'm going to get every cent of it back because I'm going to eat four steaks, three baked potatoes, and I'm going to wipe out the dessert bar. D don't do that. The next thing you do, if you do stuff like that, you're going to be wanting to rise up and play. Not, you're, I'm not saying you're going to want to go out and take your clothes off like they did and get involved in sexual immorality, but I'm, I'm saying it's just not, it's not good to activate the sin nature that's still in the body. Don't do, don't do that. I, I know that the old man is dead. I know that we now have the life of God in us. Your spirit is no longer uh, sinful. Your spirit has been recreated, but you still live in your body and your flesh. Your flesh can give you trouble. Don't do things that just make the flesh get all fired up uh, and, and you get all agitated in, in that sin nature. Hallelujah. Have you ever noticed that food tastes so good when you almost keep your body on edge where you stay hungry, you're not stuffing it, but you enjoy food, but you just never never quite fill the tank up all the way. Have you ever noticed how good food tastes? Woo, hallelujah, when you're always just a little bit hungry. Okay, I'm just trying to work through this verse. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ. Some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now watch this. Watch. Paul said, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition. The word admonition means teaching, instruction. They were written for our instruction, in essence, that we don't get tangled up in the things they got tangled up in. And you read those things, those stories, you, you read the, the wonderful books of the Old Testament, and you just think, Lord, I, I want to do it right. I don't want to get caught in these things they got caught in. And it says, upon whom, referring to us, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So we are right there at the end of the line. There's not much time left. And so we don't need to get off track 
like so many of them did. So I love reading the Old Testament. I, I read some of it every day because it's fascinating. But remember, the Old Testament was written for the Jews. These books, Ephesians, you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, these things are written for you and I. These are written to the church. And we have record of the old covenant to give us instruction to live right and to serve the Lord. Because you could see that when Israel did not serve the Lord, things did not go well. All of that is instruction, admonition that makes us want to do it the right way. Praise God. So it's continuing revelation. The more time you spend in the word, you're going to get more and more illumination. Back in the old covenant, they had light. But they had light concerning what was coming. The light got stronger and stronger. Eventually, Jesus came on the scene. Now, when you read the epistles, you will get much deeper revelation of why Jesus went to that cross. Not just the fact that he did. You could read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll realize, yes, he went to the cross. Uh, Jesus died on the cross. And uh, that's wonderful. I'm not quite sure what it all means, but it happened. Well, you get into the epistles, you'll very, very quickly find out what that was all about, how it applies to your life, and it will begin to open up to you the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God. Praise God today. Now, I want to show you the power of Paul writing to you and I of how we are to live our lives as believers. And this is just so powerful when you know that this is written to us. This is written directly to the church. We don't have to look back. We're not going under the law. This is not something that we're trying to figure out with Old Testament types and shadows. No, this is meat and potatoes, crystal, clear cut. You can read it. You can walk it. You can believe it. You can apply it today. It's so good. Let's take a look at a few of these things that I just wanted to highlight. It'll be such a blessing to you as you spend time as well in the epistles. Verse 25, Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Wow. Wow. We don't need any interpretation on that. You don't need to know the Greek. You don't need to know the, uh, the, the original meaning that it is translated. There it is. Isn't that powerful? Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary building up. Wouldn't that be amazing? The things that come out of our mouth build up. We're constantly building up people. We're constantly speaking into the atmosphere of our nation. You know, there are, there are some people that Uh, I think they actually would love to see America destroyed. That's kind of like wanting to take a gun out and shoot yourself in the foot. It's almost like these people that are preaching, some ministers that are preaching that God's going to destroy America. It's like I want to say, hey, don't you understand if America's destroyed, you're getting wiped out too? I mean, how can America be destroyed and the citizens not be destroyed? (laughs) It's just like, do you really want that to happen? Shouldn't you speak edification? Oh, I know America has many challenges. I know the enemy is trying to do things to cause great havoc in the nation, but I believe God has a destiny, has a purpose for this country, and the fullness of it has not yet been fulfilled. I believe the greatest mandate of America is to be a primary instrument in preaching the gospel to all the world. You know what? I've been to nations, even I'm I'm talking even modern advanced nations. They won't even let you have, uh, they won't even let you have a satellite uh, Christian network. You you can go to Singapore. Singapore is a beautiful country and they're, they're very strong churches in Singapore But did you know in Singapore, if you want to start a Christian television network, you can't do it 
it's it's there is a national ban on that but here in america we have multiple networks i mean we've got networks growing all the time i'm talking christian networks we are sending the gospel and you have people in singapore that are watching what is being broadcast out of america america is a breadbasket of divine provision from god to propagate the gospel around the world through financial strength hallelujah that's one of our responsibilities can you imagine if america went under who could fill the gap oh there's many nations that have powerful ministries that are preaching the gospel but from a perspective of who is pulling the largest load that my friends is the american church praise the lord i mean you look at even things that would not even be from a perspective spiritual look at natural disasters when hurricanes come in and wipe nations out when nations even on the other side of the planet have problems who's there first the, the american ministries are it, it's a, and i'm talking not just coming in with a little bitty van load of food we're talking about ships and airplanes on behalf of christian ministries it, i mean it's incredible staggering hallelujah so my friends america has a destiny let's speak good over our nation let's speak good over our beloved president donald trump he's a good man with a very very difficult assignment but yet god's grace is with him god's anointing is upon him i prophesied even before he was ever elected that he was called by god as a jehu to overthrow the jezebel assignment and I believe he did just that. Now he is working. I believe we can see revival begin to come forth in this nation. Oh, glory to God. We must speak good over our nation. Hallelujah. Let no corrupt words come out of your mouth. Praise the Lord. And you know, even, even the people, even the people that would try to destroy the nation, the socialist, the Hollywood liberals, that you think what they're doing, you, you think, do they actually want to see our country destroyed? Because if what they desire comes to pass, this nation will completely fall apart. It, but, but, you know, it's all, they're, they're doing that because of money. But even still, over those people, we pray that their eyes be opened. What they're doing is wrong. And if they don't repent, eventually there will come a reckoning for what they're doing. But even still, we pray for those that would even try to sow discord and chaos. We pray for them that they be saved. I, you know, I pray for George Soros that he be saved. He's an old man. He needs to know the Lord. Hallelujah. And I know he funds many things through his own financial strength that would be completely contradictory to the will and the word of God. But nevertheless, Jesus Christ died for George Soros too. And I pray for him. Hallelujah. I pray for Oprah Winfrey. I pray for people that need Christ, not because they're famous, but just because they have a soul. They have a soul and God loves them too. And God sent his only son to die on their behalf. That if they'll just put their faith and trust in Jesus, they can receive eternal life just like we have. So I pray for those people. So we want to be people that follow verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now look at verse 31. How amazing this is concerning instruction for New Testament living. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So this is very, very different uh, from Old Testament. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Pastor Stephen, he broke my tooth out. Uh, I'm going to break his jaw. No, no, no. Come on over into the new covenant. See, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, chapter 5, verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness. Now, the uncleanness there in, in, in context is sexual impurity. Any form of sexual impurity 
strive to remove that out of your life, whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're an adult, whether you are a child. We are inundated with filth in our culture, unlike anything ever seen in the history of the world. And it's not just America. Uh, it's on it's on every network, every te- uh, every secular network, and every um, every place pretty much in the world. I know you have countries like China, so forth, that censor a lot of things, censor the daylights out of YouTube, and a lot of stuff on YouTube is not good. It needs to be censored. But my goodness, never in the history of the world have we had such a proliferation of sexual impurity where you can you can just reach it within seconds through the internet and so forth. So my friends, work to be in a place where you do as much as you can to cut off anything that would bring sexual uncleanness into your life. Don't let it contaminate you. Praise God. Verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. You really need to look at yourself in the identification of how God sees you. God sees you as a saint. We're not talking about the New Orleans football team. We're we're not talking about even what the Catholic Church would identify as great saints, men and women who lived remarkable lives and yielded their life to the Lord and God did amazing things to their lives. But from a from a scriptural perspective, any believer is a saint. Hallelujah. And you need to see yourself as a saint. And you need to you need to think, well Lord, I'm a saint. I need to I need to live a life that's clean. Praise God. A life befitting a saint. Praise the Lord. Th- this is all in the book of Ephesians. These are the things you find in the epistles. You need to spend time in the epistles. Why? It'll teach you how to live your life as a Christian. Hallelujah. Look at this. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Replace all crude, coarse joking and jesting with thanksgiving. Praise the Lord. Now, I have to be honest. I've been around some ministers who even get over into the area of gray jokes. Oh, they know it's not like full-blown dirty, but they know it also has a insinuation of crudeness. We should never, ever do that. You know what? You can be funny with clean humor. You, you don't have to get dirty. You don't have to have coarseness and filthiness or insinuations of naughty stuff in your language. Praise the Lord. Don't ever, ever do that. Don't ever, ever do that. I don't believe there's any place ever in our language, much less in our Christian talk for such vocabulary. Praise the Lord. But rather, giving of thanks. Well, Pastor Stephen, if I'm not going to use some coarse joking, what am I going to do? You're going to be giving thanks. Lord, I praise you. Isn't the Lord good? Yes. Hallelujah. You know, just move over into a place of thanks. And you thank people too. When people do things for you, you thank them. And you just replace all the yucky stuff with the heart of thanksgiving, where good begins to flow out of you. Remember, Jesus said, you can't have salt water and fresh water flowing out of the same source. It, it's just not possible. <laughs> you can't have a fig tree, you know, producing figs and thorns. No, no, it's going to be one or the other. So there needs to be a clean stream coming out of you. If there's any type of coarse joking, coarse jesting, look, if you do that, it's it starts to go downhill real quick. And the next thing you've done, you, you've said something that's that's wrong. Don't don't go into that descent. Don't ever go there. If you do that, you're getting into the flesh. Stay in the spirit. So much of what we've talked about today is governing our tongues and the way that we talk. 
Hallelujah. My friends, if you want to know how to live your life as a New Testament believer, things you can apply now. We're not talking about animal sacrifices. We're not talking about uh, Levitical rules of the priest. All that stuff was cool. Old covenant, nice to know, good examples, admonition, and teaching of how to live today. But if you want to know how to live as a believer, you need to spend time in the epistles. And I will also explain to you through the teachings of Paul, through the teachings of Peter, through the teachings of James and John, it will explain to you in crystal clear clarity what Jesus accomplished for you at Calvary, what the benefits of that are, and how you can access it through faith, which we now have in Christ. Praise the Lord. My friends, the knowledge of God is progressive. It is continually unfolding. The more time you spend in the truth of God's word, particularly the epistles, the greater light and the knowledge of God that you will walk in. See, maybe you read the Bible five years ago, and you just read through the New Testament, and you think, well, I did it once. I don't need to do it again. But you go back and you start reading, and uh, you know what? I've read the Bible many, many times, but sometimes I, I read it, and I just think, Lord, I, Lord, I know I've read this before, but I, this is like I've never seen this yet. This is like I'm looking at this for the first time. So there is progressive, ongoing revelation. It will be like that until we go home to be with the Lord. And then when we go to be with the Lord, then we will know even as he knows. Amazing statement that Paul made concerning what it will be like when we get to heaven. Praise God. We're going to have tremendous knowledge, tremendous knowledge of God. But my friends, we need to open our hearts now to the Lord and receive what he wants us to know so that we can have a successful, blessed, happy life and that we can fulfill what God has called us to do. Praise the Lord. So, Father, I pray for your people that there be a new love for the teachings in the New Testament. Oh, God, we thank you for this. We just thank you, oh, God, for opening up our understanding that we are in a very blessed position of knowing a lot and at the same time realizing there's more to come. There's more revelation to come. And we thank you, Father God, that even, even the best is yet to come. So much of, of the book of Revelation has not even transpired yet. So, Father, we thank you. We want to be on the cutting edge of walking in the knowledge of your word. So, Father God, even as the psalmist said, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Let us walk in the light. We thank you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's nothing faster than light. If you want to figure something out, you need light. If you want to, if you want to make good choices, you need light. Light will dispel darkness, and there's nothing that can dispel it faster than the Word of God. This is the light of God. Light traveling at 186,000 miles per second. There's nothing faster. When you get in here, it'll come fast and, and wonderfully. Praise God. Okay, so let's take communion together today and celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ. Please grab some unleavened bread and some grape juice. Praise God. So, Father, we bless and consecrate this communion. We thank you that this is now the flesh and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let me read a, a scripture to you from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you, see, this, we're, he's talking to New Testament Christians, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So we used to be outside of the family of God, but because we have put our faith and trust in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have now been brought near by his blood. So how do we know that? Through the teachings of the new covenant as expressed here through the Apostle Paul. So Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus, the body of of the Lord Jesus Christ as we receive his flesh 
We eat it, and we thank you for progressive, ongoing revelation in his name. Amen. May your eyes receive light to understand the scriptures. Let's receive. Praise the Lord. Light. Understanding. How about this? Light that keeps you up at night. Light that so illuminates you that you've got to talk about it. Remember on the road to Emmaus, the two men walking, Luke chapter 24, and it's the third day Jesus has been in the grave, but he has arisen that morning. So these two guys are, they're walking along the road, going from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a seven mile journey. Jesus draws near, but they don't recognize him. This is the resurrected Christ walking with them. And so along the road, along this seven mile walk, he begins to expound to them the Old Testament scriptures and reveals from the scriptures everything that the prophet said that the Messiah would have to go through. So he was basically telling them, look, the Messiah had to go through all of these things. Why are you so stunned by it? Everything that he that happened was exactly what was foretold about him. Wow. And you and I know these things. That This is stuff that you and I easily grasp now. So after walking seven miles and getting to the house, the Lord pretended as, he, as if he would keep on going. But they said, oh, no, you, what you're sharing with us is marvelous. Please come inside and, and stay with us. And so they had a little meal, and the Lord broke bread. And when he broke the bread, which is what we're doing right now, the, they realized this is Jesus. And then he disappeared right in their midst. What did they do when they realized, oh my goodness, it was, yes, it was Jesus. Our hearts were on fire the entire time he was walking with us, expounding the scriptures. In other words, as light was coming, as light was coming, there was fire burning. What did they do? They immediately got back up and walked all the way back to Jerusalem. Now remember when you're going to Jerusalem, you're going uphill. Jerusalem is, is uh, it's called a mountainous area, but it's, it's really large hills from what we would say. They walk seven miles all the way back. 14, look, I'm just trying to tell you when light breaks forth, you're happy to walk 14 miles. You're walking in the light. You're just like, this is so incredible. They thought, this is so incredible. We have got to go back and tell the 11. We've got to tell Peter. We've got to tell Mary. We've got to tell the guys what has happened. And they walk seven miles immediately back. So you get in the light. You might just walk 14 miles. You're so wound up about the revelation. I'm telling you, these revelations are life-changing. As we drink the blood of Jesus, may the light of God's word dispel all darkness out of any situation that has tried to keep you hostage or bondage. Those of you that have been sick, you've had certain types of illnesses f for long, long time. May the light of God's word and his healing power dispel that foul sickness out of your body. So much light that it just can't stay anymore. So much understanding and knowledge of what Jesus did for you that this stuff, it just, it's too weak because this is too strong. And the weak, the sickness bows and leaves. Just too much light. The word is just too strong. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. It is through the blood of Christ that we have now been brought near. Father, we drink it now and thank you for great illumination, great revelation from your word, great understanding of how to live a life that's pleasing to you in Jesus name. Amen. Let's receive the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know, you know a lot now, three years from now, should the Lord tarry, you're going to know a whole lot more. You're going to know a whole lot more. 
God is taking you to in, into an immersive walk with him, into his word. And the Holy Spirit is just illuminated, illuminating it unlike anything you've ever experienced before. Why? Speed of light is fast. We're fast approaching the end of the age. Revelation, knowledge is going to spring forth with such understanding that you will look back and think, wow, I have increased so much. Okay, so get ready to run at the speed of light. Run with revelation, understanding at the speed of light. The light, this is the light coming into your understanding. Father, we thank you. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time.